Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. This episode may contain explicit language. Welcome to Karen Feeding, the show where we parent together. I'm Lucy Lopez, the host of the Mamacita Rica podcast, Mama to Amelia 13 and Avery 11, and we're from Miami. I'm Zach Rosen. I host The Best Advice Show. That's another podcast. And I am dad to Noah, who's six, and Ami, who's three. We live in Detroit. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 11, Oliver, who's nine, and Teddy, who's seven. We live in Tokyo, Japan. Today on the show, we've got a preschooler who's suddenly having some big, scary feelings at school. Her dad is deployed right now, so is this normal or the start of a more serious anxiety issue? And either way, how can this parent help? Later on, we're also going to recommend some things we're loving right now and think you might too. And then if you're in the Slate Plus Club, we'll play a round of parenting, Would You Rather? Here's what you'll hear if you have Slate Plus. Would you rather be in front of a crying baby on a plane without any earplugs or headphones, or would you rather be that baby's parent? I would rather be in front of the crying baby because I, I, I see the glares that parents get on the airplane when their baby's crying. I feel so bad for them because we've all been in that position. And so I have nothing but sympathy and empathy for for that I would assure them that they've got nothing to worry about, um, even though their baby's screaming in my ear. Am I traveling with Jeff? Because if so, I'll be the baby's parent. <laughs> because I truly believe that when you hand a crying baby to the male to the partner, yep. that the whole attitude changes. You are now flying with the world's best father. And look at them. They're whole, they are doing everything they can to hold this crying baby. By becoming a Slate Plus member, you'll enjoy a weekly bonus segment and all your beloved Slate podcasts without any advertisements. It's the ultimate way to enhance your listening experience while also providing vital support to the show. You can join Slate Plus today by visiting slate.com slash care plus. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, but we'll see you back here in a minute for our listener question. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. We're back, and we're diving into our listener question. Hi, Karen Feeding. My three-and-a-half-year-old goes to preschool a few days a week and generally likes it. She is extroverted and independent and pretty mild-mannered for the most part. She goes with the flow and is just a happy kid. In the last couple weeks, we've had two instances of her getting unconsolably upset at school out of nowhere. The first time, the school ended up calling me because she couldn't stop crying for 20 minutes and was just repeating that she wanted me and missed me. I know she's three and prone to big feelings, but this is extremely weird behavior for her, and I'm concerned that she's having a panic attack. I have never not picked her up from preschool. Her dad is deployed right now, but has been for months now with no issues up until now, and she talks to him regularly on video chat. I tried talking to her about it after she stopped crying, but she still just says she wanted me there. Is this a normal phase, or should I be trying to get professional help involved? How can I help her work through these feelings in the meantime? Elizabeth, do you want to be yeah. first in line? So, go ahead. first of all, like, great job during this deployment. Deployments are super hard. I feel like during deployments... Like, just all the things happen. This is like, like it's if you were my friend and you called me, I'd be like, yeah, it's a deployment. All of a sudden, your child is happy having separation anxiety after never having it. Like, this is a very mm. normal thing. Hmm. 
I know that you're keeping regular contact. For a kid this young, it's like very hard to know what they know and understand, right? Like, I'm sure that you have explained the deployment, explained that that dad is gone, but will be coming back. But like, all of that is so abstract. And I just think, you know, children of all ages, but particularly in these toddler years, speak to us with their behavior. So I think Mm. knowing like, hey, this child is trying to tell me something that, that they're not feeling great about something, the fact that they're crying at school is is somehow, um, and, and needing you is like a cry for some kind of attachment or, or trying to let you know that something is wrong. And I know that you have tried to have a conversation or talk about it. And I just think that this young, like they don't even know. They, and sometimes our words themselves are not enough the way with an older child. Like they're just mm-hmm. not able to understand like, well, dad doesn't come back all the time, but he is coming back eventually. But like, I'm going to come back every day. Like that's actually kind of a really complicated um, mm-hmm. thing. So I I wanted to start by just making you aware, if you're not already, of some amazing resources that are going to help you, I think specifically with the deployment stuff, um, which is I think where I can help. And then we can all talk about the separation anxiety stuff. But um, Military One Source has a deployment link, and all of this is going to be in the show notes. And on that link um, has a whole list of things that that can help you during this time. It has articles, it has um, tons of resources, but on there specifically is a link to the Family Life Counseling Program. This is a free counseling that is provided to military families. It can be online, and I would call it more like parent coaching. Like this is not going to be something your child goes to. This is going to be someone you can talk to about this specific issue. And if you just follow that link and get that set up, because I do think that talking to someone who who knows specifically about deployments would be really helpful to you. I also want to um, point you towards there's a Sesame Street for military families um, link, and they have wonderful videos and stuff aimed at exactly your child's age to try to help them um, understand and not feel alone um, on on this. There's also a beautiful book called Maggie the Military Rat. It's it's kind of new, written by a military spouse that just talks about being a military child. My kids feel so seen reading this book, and I think mm. just having uh, your child understand that they're not alone and explaining some of these issues. It doesn't speak like all to deployment, but specifically to kind of being a kid who's living um, this life. So I would I would start there. I have some more thoughts, but I I want to pass to you guys about the either the deployment thing or just like about the separation anxiety kind of in in general. This does feel like specific to the deployment piece, but it's also just like I don't know when your three year old started going to school. You know, I know that they're just going a few days a week and generally like it, but like this is still a massive transition, you know, military or not, and like Elizabeth said, like, you know, these feelings bubble up, they kind of can come like waves. And I would imagine that they will dissipate at some point, especially as you continue to be a constant for them and assure them that you will always be there. But I mean, I could also see talking to a therapist as being, you know, totally a a great option now. For me, uh, I just I can't wrap my head around the idea of parenting alone for long stretches, you know, of time, you know, like it must be hard on everybody, right? Like the entire family. But I I just would assume that the best advice would be try to make things a little bit more comfortable and surround yourself with as much information as possible. Um, I didn't even know like Sesame Street had a whole thing for military families. But whenever I'm scared, uh, my go to is I want to learn everything about what I'm scared about. And um, I think the more you talk to your kid and the, and the more you make that that baby feel comfortable and heard, uh, I have a feeling things will ease up a little bit, right? No, I think that's um, great advice. I, I feel, and 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 that might mm-hmm. sound a little like la la la, but I, I don't know. I just feel like sometimes the easiest approach is just to be there for your child, 
no matter what. Yeah. I mean, also like getting the teacher involved is, um, you know, the teachers are our eyes and ears in school and you, you, you want to make sure that there's nothing, you know, uh, strange going on between, you know, you and the teacher or you or, or your kid and some other kids, there could be some conflict, but like really lean on the teacher and make your needs known, let, let them know that you're concerned. And when typically, I mean, for good teachers, when you tell, when you tell teachers that you have concerns, they're going to come up with a plan for you and they might even like text you um we get texts from ami's daycare throughout the day um just like with pictures of him like doing happy things uh, another thing that our daycare does is um they have pictures of the families which you know might put your kid at ease too like when they're having big feelings like the teacher can present them with a picture of them with their family um for some comfort that might also um, provide some temporary relief i think yeah i think all those kind of separation anxiety things and we've certainly uh like if you want to hear more on this i think we've had several like episodes just about separation anxiety but i think things like is there some kind of transitional object so um i know for my kids one of the things we did was like a mommy and me bracelet so like we made bracelets together i wore one he wore one and it was like a nice reminder like hey we i'm still here and i'm thinking about you i have mine on you have yours on is there like mm-hmm. a um a stuffy a uh you know a doll or something that she can put in yes. her book bag And then, you know, talking to the teacher, like when she feels sad, she can go give it a hug. Like what kind of thing like that, that you can come up with a solution um, for making sure they understand that that connection is still there. Something also that helped um, uh, Henry, who has a lot of anxiety, is running through the script of not only how the day is going to go, but if I didn't show up, what would happen? Um, Because I think he was so worried and in his brain, even at a young age, would would kind of spiral about just like me never coming back to say, like, if I was running late, the teachers would do X, Y, Z with you. So like you are still safe. Right. If something happened to me and I didn't come, this is the person that comes to get you. The office has their phone number. And my child with anxiety would like repeat all that back to me to the point of which mm-hmm. every day when we were like going to this thing where he was worried, he would be like, and if you don't come, you know, like Miss Michaela's coming and be like, yes, if I don't come, Miss Michaela will come get you. Like just letting them know, like you have a plan in place. They don't have to worry about any of that. And I think we tell them that we say like, don't worry, I've taken somebody else would come get you. But to say like, this is what will happen. Like I have thought about it. Uh, the other thing is, I don't know if you're doing anything in the house to like track the deployment time, but that is something that also really helped my kids. And this can be, um, I I actually learned this from a first responders family who they keep one of these every time he stays at the, the firehouse. But we make a paper chain with one for each day. And the whole point of the paper chain is that you could mm. add more loops if that deployment time frame changes. Because if you are partnered with someone whose job sends them away, we all know that those times are often not what they say they're going to be. But we make a big paper chain and every morning or every night before bed, we tear off one of the chains to just like watch it get shorter, which I just think is a nice way for kids to visualize. Uh, I know other people that like have two jars and you watch everything go from one jar to the other jar. All I say in the system is make sure that it's it's fudgeable so that you can remove or add as as you know kind of the adult timetable changes. But I think something to demonstrate this kind of passing of time because that is what this separation anxiety is is like not understanding how long someone will be gone um, and just these big feelings. So I I I it's tough though. I just want to give this mama a hug. Yeah. I, I want to mm. give her a hug, too, because I'm having these flashes of when we used to, you know, Avery had a really hard time going to preschool. Um, and one of the things that we used to do was right before we would drop her off, we'd ask her, I want you to, if you can just tell mama and papa three things that are going to make you happy today mm. or make you feel good. And she would go from snack, monkey bars, go home. And she was around three years old when she was expressing these feelings to us. Um, And then eventually the go home part started to fade away. And 
it wasn't so much more about the snack, but about spending time with a friend, her, her one of her best friends, Ona. And then she'd be like, then she would go down the list of like, well, Ona and and lunch and um, finger paint. And so, you know, don't don't underestimate your your child, especially at that age, if they're three years old and they're expressing these big, scary feelings to you. Maybe you should have that conversation right before you drop them off and remi- and try to you know, kick off the day, the, their morning with like, just tell me three fun things you're going to mm. do today. Or what are the three happy moments you're going to have today in, in, you know, in class and have her share that with you. And then obviously when you pick them up from preschool, bring it up again. Be like, so did you do those three things or was there extra? And I remember that really started conversations between mm. Avery and us because she was, she I remember one day she came home from school and she goes, I like snack. I like cookies. I don't like school. And that was for like two months. And eventually the I don't want to go to school went away. But it was an opportunity for her to express herself in a different way where she didn't break down crying about not wanting to go to school. Mm. I did want to mention, which we've mentioned before, the book, The Invisible String, uh, which is, I just think children's book are the best, but this just talks about kind of that connection no matter how far apart you are. And it's something that we still, I think, kind of use the metaphor of in our house. It's such a a lovely book. So I I would definitely recommend, you know, there's so many children's books too about school and about uh, the anxiety, but it's, it's so tough. It's so tough. I don't know. I, the other really quick thing is I don't know how much flexibility you have, but at three, it's also possible that m- maybe right now the school day is just too long. Like, I don't know if the meltdowns are all happening around the same time, but that might be something else in talking with the teacher. And as Zach said, these, you know, the good thing about the teacher is they have like seen it all. So they yeah. might have some suggestions too. Like, did, is it always happening in the afternoon? Is it always happening like about this time? Uh, you Are know, they napping? They, d- yeah, in this phase, like, do they need a nap? Do they need to like come home earlier? That may not be an option, but also, what kind of snack are they having? What What's their lunch looking like? I'm being serious. No, a lot sure. of variables. Just, you know, sometimes just giving your kid, you know, a little box of you know Cheez Its may not be something that their body needs at that time. She might need like you know a little bit of peanut butter and apples or well, some schools don't allow peanut butter but you know what i mean yeah. like a little something extra yeah are there any little tweaks you can do i think is what we're asking like in schedule or in what's happening to just try to just try to get get through this i mean as with most things so at this age it's like this too will pass and feels like a complete disaster i know that feeling like when the school calls and you're just like again like why is this happening again <laughs> like, i thought we were over this all right, listeners, what advice do you have for our letter writer? Send it into careandfeedingpod at slate.com or leave a voicemail at 646-357-9318. That's also where you can send in any questions of your own and we might answer it on the show. We're going to take one more break and see you back here for recommendations. Let's move on to recommendations. <laughs> Zach, what are you recommending this week? I'm recommending a show that we have been watching all together as a family. It's a Netflix series called Life on Our Planet. It's executive produced by Steven Spielberg and narrated by the great Morgan Freeman. Um, it you know think like David Attenborough style nature documentary but what this show does so incredibly is it uses cgi uh to like recreate the history of the history of living things on our planet starting from tiny little creatures in the sea to you know how they how they eventually got on land to dinosaurs which is like ami's favorite thing right now um and it looks like it's like a documentary it, it looks like footage of Life on Earth with dinosaurs um, and woolly mammoths and saber toothed tigers. It's unbelievably gorgeous. Uh, I, I think the show may, might have gotten some criticism for not being like entirely accurate, but I don't really care about that. I mean, I think the gist um, is clear. They're telling the story of evolution in kind of the most spectacular way I've ever seen. And if, if your kids are um, prone to getting scared 
by seeing big creatures. This isn't for them. But both my kids, three and six, are really into it. And it's it's incredible. Highly, highly recommend Life on Our Planet on Netflix. This sounds right up my alley. And I, oh my God, it's so I cool. don't know why I haven't heard of it. And I, I hadn't heard of it yeah, either. I, I, I just am... did a, a cursory search for dinosaurs on Netflix and this came up. <laughs> We're going to check it's this pretty out. pretty great. And by the way, Morgan Freeman on anything. I know. Yes, please. Oh, my God. Do you know what's also really fun? You put the subtitles on and then read it in your Morgan Freeman impression. <laughs> uh, my kids are really enjoying my my cover of Morgan Freeman. It's oh really fun. Oh, my gosh. I have to try that. I like that. It's super fun. What about you, Elizabeth? I apparently it's thematic history week for me, too, because I'm also recommending something kind of history. We found this great game called Timeline Twist. It's a card game. It can literally be played with any ages. Um, It is essentially a cooperative game where you are building a timeline. Each card has like an event in history. Uh, There might be different like packs. Ours has kind of like world history it has everything from like the creation of the can opener to you know moon landing by the u.s russian moon landing like the great fire of london domestication of cats and basically Hmm. you have the there's all these rules but you have these cards everybody has four cards and we're trying to add them to the timeline if you skip too large of a gap of course that like um you know, precludes other people from adding things to the timeline. It's it's super fun. What I like about it is that you're sort of trying to ballpark where it's going to be, but to actually place it, you get to turn it over and see the year. So that is why, like, even Teddy can play because he'll read out his cards or we'll help him, you know, kind of know what the thing is. We sort of discuss as a family what we think should go on the timeline, and then he gets to flip it and he can read the numbers for the year. So it's a really great way where we're all um, brushing up on our history. We've Jeff is home and we've learned that he uh, apparently memorized everything from history class. He's like, oh, that's this year. Uh, I Hmm. also discovered that the uh, can and can opener developed in different years, which led to some some interesting discussion in our house. (laughs) Like even the manual can opener? This was development of the manual can opener, development of the can. And there's like a five year gap. (laughs) (laughs) I assume people were like using a knife or prying it open. I have not gotten around to Google it. This was last night's dinner discovery. Um, (laughs) It's really, it's really fun though. And you know, I'm a sucker for a game that's like teaching us something. So it's called Timeline Twist. Nice. Oh, I love that. Well, I guess I'm up next. Um, I just was lucky enough to be invited to a uh, premiere of Orion and the Dark. It's a new movie on Netflix by DreamWorks. Um, it's about a kid with an active imagination and he faces its fe- his fears and it's it's a really good film. Angela Bassett is wow. in it. Um, the main character is played by uh, Jacob Tremblay. He was like this, you know, this kid actor. I loved it. Um, I'll tell you why I liked it. My 13 year old loved it. And to get a 13 year old, like just to sit and watch an animated movie is beyond. Um, Mm. It was incredibly entertaining. It was wonderful to to like watch. And it's a family movie. So like, yeah, like your kids can definitely watch it. I, I don't know. Maybe it could get like a little dark just because his imagination goes wild. Um, but I don't think it's like scary to where, you know, you're not going to have any issues after they see a couple scenes, if that makes yeah. sense. But um, you'll be able to uh, watch it on Netflix February 2nd. Sweet. And it's a pretty awesome movie and it entertained me and my husband and my kids loved it. So, yeah. We'll definitely That's watch my that. recommendation. Perfect. Great. Family yeah. movie it's, night. It was great. Before we go, it's time for our mini mailbag. A couple weeks ago, Zach shared during Triumphs and Fails that he had to cheat during a game of Battleship to put he and Noah out of their misery. Uh, The consensus was that maybe Battleship just sucks. I agree. But Mm -hmm. one of you has a potential solution. This game is like Battleship (laughs) and Beer Pong together. (laughs) It's actually great. It's called Battleship Shots from Hasbro Gaming. This looks intriguing. Uh, 
if anyone has played beer pong before, <laughs> I feel like beer pong can just be like water pong, you know, and you can play this with yeah, all ages. Yeah, I can't ages. imagine that the listener is suggesting you play beer pong. Of course, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I, I know that they weren't. Um, but I think instead of buying this game, which does look fun, but it is like $30 and it basically is just like a pl- some plastic um, and some balls. I feel like you could just DIY this, which might be fun, but I really do appreciate the sentiment because I would much rather play Battleship Shots than Battleship. So um, I really, really like this recommendation. Thank Put you. Put juice in a few of them. <laughs> Put juice in them, yes, Or exactly. you could have have beer in yours. And maybe that would solve the battleship problem. Now you're talking. Yes. <laughs> That's a good and idea. And hope nobody gets confused. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Things could go terribly wrong. I thought it was apple juice. <laughs> battleship shots. Okay. We always want to hear what you're loving. Uh, so be sure to reach out to us and keep the conversation going. And uh, that's our show. Please subscribe, leave a rating and review and tell your friends. This episode of Karen Feeding is produced by Mara Curry with special thanks to Rosemary Belson. Shasha Leonard is the voice of our listeners. Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Slate Audio for Elizabeth Newcamp and Zach Rosen. I'm Lucy Lopez. Thanks for listening. <laughs>